Hello and welcome to another edition of Capital City Matters. My name is John Landwehr and I used to be mayor and we started this program when I was mayor and we talked about things going on in the community and in talking with the folks at JCTV we thought well you know there are some things going on in the community other than uh, politics and City Hall and so we're going to continue to uh, do the program for a while and see how it goes and it's been fun and interesting. Uh, because it's an opportunity to take a few minutes and explore a topic in more detail than we might normally see in just a sound bite or a, or a quick uh, presentation uh, in some other media. Today, um, there's a really a neat, interesting phenomenon going on in the community, and the acronym is CASA, C-A-S-A. -A. a few months ago, we had uh, some folks on from the CASA program talking about how the program was going to uh, ramp up. And I'm proud to say that today we have some folks to talk about what is becoming a very mature program in Jefferson City. I have Jim Kellerman, who's the executive director of, the, of CASA, and that's the Court Appointed Special Advocates Program. And we have a volunteer, Carolyn Campeter, with us today. Um, Jim, the last time we got together and talked, we didn't have any volunteers. That's uh, we, right. We didn't, we didn't have any, anything in the real world to report other than kind of a dream. And I'm proud to say that uh, today we've got uh, some, uh, some uh, very good progress. First of all, for folks who, who don't know what CASA is, or when we say court-appointed special advocates, what the, even that is, Jim, tell us quickly, what, what is the program all about? Our major assignment is to recruit and train volunteers who represent children who end up in the court system through no fault of their own. Abuse, child neglect, and uh, they are advocates on behalf of the children. And one of the beauties of this program is that uh, our volunteers are assigned a case, one case, and they stick with it till its completion. Now this isn't just a Cole County program or even a Missouri program, it's a national program, right? It's correct. It's a, I can't tell you how many programs across the nation, but there are 22 such programs in the state of Missouri. So, uh, I know uh, one of the one of the persons that persons that kind of got us going uh, in in the in the Casa world was our uh, Supreme Court Judge Mary Rhodes Russell uh, is very active. Uh, uh, Carolyn, you're a you're one of the one of the volunteers, one of I think about 17 volunteers so far, and you were part of the first class. Uh, the classes are about about ten or so each, right, Jim? And, Correct. And uh, Carolyn was in the very first class of of the uh, of the volunteers. What what got you interested? How how did you hear about Casa? Um, well, I first heard about it. There was a little article in the newspaper, and I knew that that was something that I was looking for. My passion is really children's issues, and um, I've I've done some work in different areas like Big Brother, Big Sister, and I'm a mentor at Jeff City High School, and those are very rewarding to me, and I was looking for another um, such experience. So when I saw the little article, um, I immediately gave Jim a call and learned more about the program to see what it was and how I could participate. Now we talk about, we talk about different classes, and I think, I think the first class, your class, was, was, a, was a class of, of 10. That tells me that maybe you just don't show up and sign a few pieces of paper and get assigned to a case, right? there's a course of instruction involved. Tell me about that. Exactly, it's 10 weeks for one night a week for three hours, so it's pretty in, in, intensive um, instruction. We learn a lot about the, the court system and how it works. We learn about child development, the dynamics within families, um, some of the characteristics of abused and neglected children, the kinds of things that you look for um, in family, so it's it's a wonderful educational experience just in and of itself going through those classes. Now, Jim, the first word in the acronym is 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 court, C. Um, uh, it it is um, it's related to it's within the court system, correct? This Cor this isn't just a, a bunch of do-gooders out there who show up and and and. Um, uh, try to try to uh, try to do some good uh, on their own. This is really enmeshed in the court system, right? In fact, uh, when they complete their training and then they're sworn in by the judge and they become an officer of the court, and they work very closely with the uh, children's division, very closely with the juvenile division, 
and with, in, in particular with the guardian ad litem. Guardian ad litem is the attorney for the child or children. And uh, because they have only one case, uh, they're able to spend more time uh, with that child than perhaps either of the other divisions. I don't mean that to be a criticism. The other divisions have very heavy caseloads and it's, it's just, they just don't have the time to get out and do the in-depth research and, and, and uh, investigation that our volunteers are able to do. Now you mentioned being sworn in by the judge and appearing in court. Uh, that, could, uh, that could make some people nervous. Um, uh, what does the, does the volunteer have to, have to testify? Does the volunteer have to produce evidence or kind of act like a lawyer? Uh, What's, what's the typical, uh, Carolyn, maybe you can help with this. In a, in a, in a, you, you, is my understanding your, your case involves a three-year-old girl, mm -hmm. right? Um, on those occasions when, when you've appeared in court, tell me what's going on. Tell me what's your role. Is it, is, mm -hmm. it, is it scary, intimidating? Do you feel out of place? What's... It's really not intimidating at all because I'm really just providing additional information to some of the other participants in the court case, such as the guardian ad litem. So when, whatever I discover, I find out um, as a result of working with the child and the family, um, I, I give that information to the guardian ad litem, children's division, and, and Jim just as soon as possible so they can use it um, as a part of providing the best results for that child. So. Um, you don't necessarily have to speak in court at all. Um, you know, the guardian ad litem does that on behalf of the child. Um, but the judge may ask whether you have anything else to add. So it's, it's very unintimidating, and the judge makes it um, very unintimidating. Do you have to, um, can you communicate uh, uh, by phone and email with, with the guardian ad litem, or do you have to file official reports? What, how, how, do, how do you get information to the people that need to get the information? Um, I use email is the quickest right. and easiest way to provide information to those folks. And, and that gets put in the file as part of the, um, their official records. John, I'm asked by potential volunteers, you know, what kind of qualifications are you looking for? And the very simple answer is just, do you care about children? You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to have a children's division background. You don't have to have those kinds of things. If you care about children, and then we, we interview you. We do a background check. Last thing we want to do is hook up this child with someone who has a record of any kind. So we make sure that you're uh, a clean, good citizen that cares about children. We're going to train you and teach you the, the ropes. Uh, the judge said to me in the very beginning, uh, Jim, I'm not looking for someone to testify in court. So like Carolyn said, you don't have to stand up and testify or whatnot. They ask you to be in court when that case is being heard, and the judge may ask you a question because you're filing a report of what your finding is, and you're advocating for that child. Uh, and we've we've been you've had a couple of um, graduation uh, little social events that have been, been fun. You've got Carolyn was in the first class of ten. You just completed your second class of seven. Is that right? It, it was 11 and 6. 11 yeah. and 6, thank you. I knew the total was 17. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Just had the wrong, the wrong uh, components there. One thing I've noticed in, in attending those events is that, as you indicated, there's a, there's a very broad range of folks. They're, they're, not, they're not all social workers. They're not paralegals. Uh, broad spectrum of ages, broad spectrum of occupations. We have stay-at-home stay moms. We have... We have professional folks, uh, very broad range. So as, as you indicated, it doesn't require any special uh, expertise, uh, just uh, uh, a good soul, really. That's exactly right. Um, the training, um, 10 weeks. Uh, Carolyn mentioned some of the, some of the components. Uh, We're required by national CASA mm -hmm. to go through a, a 30 to 40 hour training. And we have a, a national curriculum that we follow. Uh, that training includes, as Carolyn outlined, we're meeting one night a week for 10 weeks, three hours, and then we ask them to go visit the court a couple times. When you add it all up, they've got 40 hours of training, and we cover everything from, you know, what is CASA to uh, how do I write a report, how do I handle those kinds of things that come before me, uh, you know, how do I deal with, some, you know, maybe the children's division has a, 
some information that's different from what I find out from the child. And that's what the judge wants. He said, if you can provide me additional information so that I as judge can make the best decision for that child because what we want to do is find some kind of permanency for that child or children, whether it's return to their parents or some other permanent relation, uh, situation. Now, Carolyn has had the same uh, case, the same uh, little girl since you began in the program, and that would have been about how long? Our first uh, uh, volunteers were assigned cases this January. Right. So nobody's been any longer than January. I would, based on what you've said, I, I, I could envision a situation where a volunteer might have a case for six months. On the other hand, a volunteer could have a case for several years. Right? Yeah, I think a, a, probably a year and a half is about the most length before right. a case is resolved. So we haven't had any yet that have come to completion. Now, one, one distinction to make, you know, sometimes when, when we hear the word, when we hear children in court, we kind of think about uh, maybe delinquency, uh, juvenile crime, uh, kids who are, who are um, working through uh, the juvenile attention center. In other words, young people who have uh, done something bad that lands them in the court system. We're, we're, not, we're not talking about really that, that group, right? That's, that's we're, exactly right. We're, we're talking about kids that, who, who have come under the direct jurisdiction of the court through no fault of their own. Exactly. You mentioned abuse, neglect. Would, yeah. the, would, would that, would that, would that, would those that two, describe those two generally? Words pretty much summarize it all. Okay. You so, know. so you've got a child maybe that where there has been abuse reported, the the court has felt the need to take the child out of the out, out of the home. Maybe the child is in a foster home or or someplace temporary, and that's when that's when this relationship is is important. Then you know our volunteers uh, meet then with the children's division, the juvenile division and the parents and uh, grandparents and other family members, their attorneys, the, the state's attorneys, et cetera, and try to map out a plan for that family to be reunited with their children. Okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna take a short break and then we're gonna come back and talk about, talk about uh, maybe Carolyn's specific case, about uh, some things going on uh, in that case, and then maybe a little more of the history on how this all got started and what, what, the, what do you see in the future. So Good. we're gonna take a break. Uh, don't go away, we'll be back in uh, just a couple minutes. Thanks for joining us. A new day is dawning for regional Girl Scouts as five councils come together to form the Girl Scouts of the Missouri Heartland. The new council serves girls in 68 counties of Missouri, Kansas, and Oklahoma, from the Boot Heel to Mid-Missouri, and from Springfield and Joplin areas to Northeast Oklahoma and Southeast Kansas. Girl Scouts of the Missouri Heartland brings new opportunities to girls while maintaining the mission of building girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. For more information, call 1-877-312-4764. Mm-hmm. Two o'clock. Okay. Your employees who serve in the National Guard and Reserve may seem different. They may work a little harder, be more confident, more willing to make the extra effort to get the job done right. So when your employees need time off to serve, remember, it's not just good for our country. It's good for your business. Glad you could all make it. John Landwehr, uh, we're in the second uh, part of a, of a very interesting little presentation about something going on in, in the community called CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates. And during the uh, first part of the show, we met uh, Executive Director Jim Kellerman, and we met uh, a volunteer, Caroline Campeter. Welcome back. Um, Carolyn, um, tell me, so, so, so the viewers can get a little bit of a feel for or what goes on in the real world with CASA. You, you, you've been assigned a, a three-year-old girl, uh, and obviously we're not gonna mention names because there are some pretty strict confidentiality uh, requirements in, in the juvenile system that I'm sure is part of your instruction. Absolutely. But uh, 
tell, tell me, tell me about a little, uh, tell, tell me a little bit about the situation of that little girl that got her uh, where she uh, was in court. Okay, um, this particular little girl um, was abused, had some fairly serious injuries, was brought to the hospital, um, barely breathing, um, lots of bruises and um, contusions and those sorts of things. So as a result of that, um, the a, a child abuse hotline called because hospitals are mandated reporters, you know, they investigate, said, said yes, this, this really is abuse, we need to remove this child from the home for their own protection while we figure out what's going on and who might have abused this child. So um, when that happens, then, you know, a petition is made to the court and, um, and the child is removed from the home and placed in some other suitable family. In my case, um, the child was placed with some family relatives. Um, who were deemed to be safe, and again, background checks to make sure it's a safe place for the child. So um, what I do in, in my case then is talk with the family, um, the, the family members where the child may be placed, um, talk with the child to see how the child is doing, you know, where is the child happy, what kind of issues are happening there, and uh, any family members that are involved or might be involved um, in the welfare of that child. When, when did you get, at what stage of that process did you get a phone call, I guess, from Jim Kellerman that said, that said uh, uh, we've, we've got a case, and mm -hmm. at, what, at what stage did you get that phone call? Well, when a child is removed, there's, there's a requirement that within 24 hours there is a hearing to make sure that they, they really should be removed, and at that point, um, Jim is involved, and he then makes a, made a call to me, and I was able to attend the 72-hour hearing for that child, so I got involved very early on after the child was removed from the home. Now, now you mentioned, you know, we talked in the first part about appearing in court, uh, but what Carolyn, what you've described are communications that are kind of ongoing with with the family and with the child, so that when when you do send information to the guardian ad litem or when you're or when you're in court helping with the report that you've got some background information, uh, Jim, if if the child is, um, you know, the, 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 type of, the type of communications we di would be different with a 16-year-old as opposed to a, to a three-year-old. Yes, definitely. What, what other, what types of communication, if, if I were assi assigned a case of a, let's say a 12-year-old, what, what types of communicating would I do outside the court system just in order to be an advocate for the child? Well, depending on the case, you might go. Uh, you might go to the school, talk with the, pe the teachers, uh, the counselor at the school. You might go to their church if they're involved in the church. You might talk with neighbors. And as a 12-year-old, you certainly can spend a lot of time and build a relationship with that 12-year-old. And he or she is then going to be able to communicate to you what's really happened in their life from their perspective. And what we have trained the volunteers to do is, you know, you're not necessarily siding with the child. You're not trying to build uh, uh, some kind of a barrier between them and the family, but this is the child's perspective of what is happening. And uh, that's what you communicate. And because you're able to spend more time and do more thorough investigating, oftentimes you can turn up information that, uh, that they do. I had one guardian ad litem tell me, my CASA worker is so good because the parents are so afraid of me as an attorney, I'm an authority figure that they'll talk to the CASA volunteer and tell her, it has to be a her, tell her everything about this case and what a contribution that is to the process that I didn't have available to me before the CASA volunteers. Well, I can imagine maybe, maybe you wouldn't feel it so much with a three-year-old, but certainly as a child gets older and they become aware that they are in a strange, hostile, potentially hostile environment a lot of adults running around, some guy in black robes in court, uh, uh, not living at home, living somewhere else. You can imagine a child not really knowing who his friends are. And I know it doesn't happen at the first meeting, but it seems like over time, the CASA volunteer could, could really just be one place, one phone call, one place that child could go where he, he, kinda, or, he or she kind of knows that, that this fella is on my side. Absolutely. Right. He's, he's not there officially. He's not getting paid. It's not his job to handle a case. Uh, we don't have enough history to be able to pass it on, but anecdotally, 
on a national level, there's a cost of volunteers who end up at the college graduation of a cost of the student that they had at 12 years old. And that 12 year old who's now graduated from college says, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Carolyn Camp either. Well, and it's a little bit more than, I, I know I've done some work with Big Brothers and Big Sisters and Carolyn, I think may, maybe you said you did too, and that's a wonderful program. It seems like it, it, it's, it has some components of Big Brother, Big Sister, spend, mm -hmm. spending some time with, uh, with, with the child, and, and that's good in and of itself, but, it, but, but it's a little more than that in terms of you're, you're not just a friend, but you're a friend who can, in, in this odd environment, can really help the child. They may not have any other person they can talk to or feel like they can talk to. Right. And another key component, I think, is the family support team meetings. So the CASA will um, attend those meetings. You know, in my case, a three-year-old child is not there because it's all adults, you know, the, the biological father, mother, and the family. And, and that's where the CASA can also represent the child because they are not involved there. So, but, and that's where a discussion takes place and we discuss the plan for permanency, whether the child goes back to the uh, biological parents or stays in another home. Jim, it, it, it's, a, it's a very professional program. The, it requires training. Um, um, and we have 17 volunteers now. I think one number I've heard is that the number 30 is kind of the sweet spot for uh, for a certain level of, of service with one, with one coordinator uh, like yourself. Um, it's not free. Uh, right. things, it, there, there, there are expenses involved, primarily the training and the ongoing supervision. You are, um, you're, uh, you're paid, I, I always used to say when I was mayor that I'm paid uh, somewhat below the minimum wage per hour uh, when, when you look at the number of hours that uh, you put into some things. Uh, you're paid. Uh, it's considered a half-time position, right? But yes. it's one of those half-time, full-time positions, I'm sure. I learned real quick that okay. it was, had full-time expectations. Many weeks. Um, so there's a budget, and um, uh, we wish that this great program could happen uh, just automatically or with some magic grant or appropriation. There are some grants and appropriations, but there is a, there is a budget. And tell us a little bit about uh, what the annual budget would look like just in broad terms. In broad terms right now, you know, we're looking at a very, relatively speaking, small budget, $30,000, $40,000, uh, which basically would cover training expenses uh, initially and staff initially at this time. Uh, part of my assignment as director is to uh, be, raise money and write grants and try to secure more funds. So I think as we become a little more uh, uh, a little further down the road in our program development, we begin to establish those kinds of things. One of the things that uh, we're doing right now that uh, we were sponsored by the Jefferson City Kiwanis Club, which was an excellent way for us to get off the ground with this program. By the way, it's the only uh, Kiwanis Club in Kiwanis International that has done such a thing. So that's kind of a feather in Kiwanis cap for doing that. But that gives us a, a, a start we get a little bit of money from, the, from them. We get uh, about $10,000 from the Missouri CASA Association that goes to the, each of the 22 programs. And then we write grants and try to find other money or uh, develop fundraisers. We, we're, I, I'm, I'm full, full disclosure, I'm on the CASA board uh, and we've been talking about, uh, talking about funding opportunities. Uh, we have a long range concept called uh, Friends of CASA. And, uh, Folks uh, in the viewing audience, hopefully uh, you'll be hearing more about this. Uh, we're looking at approaching uh, community um, community members to be to be a friend of CASA and to help uh, monetarily with the, with this program. Uh, in the short range, though, uh, we've got a fun event that uh, we'd like to raise a little money at, and it's it's one of those events that raises a little money. It's also a good time, and it also accomplishes a great purpose in and of itself and it has something to do with basketball. Tell me about that. Last year, in November, we brought in a group called the Harlem Ambassadors, similar to the Harlem Globetrotters. And we went to two of our elementary schools and the Harlem Ambassador group were willing to go to those schools and give their testimony, share their expertise, and, and show some of their tricks and so forth with the kids there. 
we gave all the kids complimentary tickets to come to the event. We are working in the community to sink sponsorships to bring them into town. I mean, it, it costs us about $3,000 to bring them in. And uh, our goal is to raise some money out of this event. Now, the message of the Harlem Ambassadors is not just about how to play a basketball game, but they went, I, I was really impressed with their, with their overall message in, yes. term, in, in terms of uh, drug free. And so you guys in the community, we'll, you'll be hearing about the Harlem Ambassadors. What's the date on that? November 17th. Uh, and we'll be getting some information out very soon. Okay. Uh, Carolyn, before we close, uh, what's this all meant to you personally? Personally to me, it's given me a chance to pursue my passion to help children become all they can be. Um, it, it also helps me get involved in the community in other ways, like with the fundraising and meeting some other wonderful people in, in the Jefferson City community. So it's, it's, there are no words to express how much it's meant to me. Well, it's a win-win from a resident and a taxpayer. You know, a child that we can keep on the right track is a great, is a great investment, even if you just look at it, at it in economic terms. Mm -hmm. But there are certainly lots of spiritual and personal advantages too. Carol and Jim, thanks for joining us today. Hope that we'll, we'll have you back soon and, and hear about uh, even greater things coming out of the CASA program, Court Appointed Special Advocates. Thanks for joining us for another session of Capital City Matters. Uh, next month, we'll have something else fun to look at. Take care.